Hello there, everybody. I'm Veronica Valley, and this is Laura McCowan. Hello. Welcome to the Soberful Facebook group. Let me just check that we are all set and live because I never have a complete confidence in technology. Um, and I'm just waiting for people to, yeah, people are jumping on there. I can see, wonderful. So hello everybody as you jump on um, and watch our uh, call, our interview today. Can't see it on there yet, but I know people are there. Yeah, hey everybody, can everyone hear us okay? Awesome, hi Alison, hi, hi, hi. Um, so the purpose of today is, Laura has very graciously um, come along to answer questions from the group about her wonderful book, We Are the Luckiest. My goodness, no. just feel like it's like, this was like such a, it was like an idea and now it's a thing. <laughs> It's, yes, it's so great. Um, so, any 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 questions that you have about the book from reading the book, or that you'd like to ask Laura, put them in the comments, and she's going to answer them for you. So, before we get started, there's a few things I uh, a couple of things we want to tell you. So, get your questions in the comments. Laura and I uh, both have um, some lots of free support going out at the moment. Uh, obviously, this is a very challenging time for many, many people, particularly people who are sober, struggling to get sober. So Laura has been running um, recovery support groups. Is that the best description? Yeah, I'm just calling them online sobriety support meetings and they are available. I'm doing one every day. So far, I'm going to keep doing them that way. I will probably get to a set schedule um, next week. But the next one is tonight uh, at seven, from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And uh, it's welcome to anybody who is on the path to recovery, is sober, is, so, is not sober, has 10 years or 10 hours. And uh, it's not a technical AA meeting. It's just a sobriety support meeting. The information can be found on my website. It's Laura McCowan, my name, .com, and you'll see a big banner at the top. You just have to subscribe once, and then you'll get the schedule. I, and I joined it last night. There was over, there was about 450 people on the call. We did a reading. I shared a little bit. Other people shared. Uh, Laura did a meditation. Uh, honestly, it was the perfect end to my day. I was having a difficult time yesterday afternoon. So um, I uh, was very grateful for that. So Laura's providing that. Go and check it out. You can, if you just find her stuff on Instagram, Laura McCowan, uh, you, you, uh, we'll post a, a link at the bottom as well. Um, I'm also starting some free uh, training in emotional freedom technique. So uh, it's a it's an awesome self help tool. I've been using it every morning in my. I'm calling it the 9 a.m. club, for want of a better word, uh, where we're doing some tapping so we can process and ground and uh, release a lot of these uh, negative feelings that we're all absorbing right now. So if you want to join the free EFT training, you uh, have to sign up for that to get the invitation for the link to the call. It's totally free. Um, and that's in the Soberful Facebook group. It's on my Instagram and it's on my Facebook page as well. So just go ahead and sign up for both of those things. So we wanted to start, questions are coming in. I, we wanted to start with just a, a reading from the book. So I think you chose something that's perfect for right now. So do you want to take it away? Oops, and I've just lost Laura. Okay, hold on. Let me just try and get her back. Hold on one second. Oh dear. Uh, okay. Give me a second, guys. Hopefully she's realized that I've lost her. Okay, hold on. Laura? There we go. There you are. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Did that kick off your Facebook Live? Um... No, I believe we're still live. Can everyone still hear us? Let me just double check. That was so strange. It just went. It just beep. it just fell. It just dropped. Yeah, it just went beep. And I don't know quite what that was about. Um, can everybody, I just want to check. Everybody still hear us and see us? It. I, I believe we're still live in Facebook. It was just you dropped off of um, the call. Yeah. Yes. Marla's saying yes. So you can see both of us. Okay, okay good. All right. So I wanted to read uh, a little bit from my book. Uh, 
I'm reading from a chapter called Forget Forever. It's towards the beginning of the book. And the background to this passage is I, uh, this is about the Monday after the last weekend I drank. And I had been trying to get sober for over a year at that point. And it was a year of, I call it purgatory. It was the hardest year of my life. I sometimes wanted to get sober, but mostly I was trying to want something that I didn't want, right? And and my drinking was getting more and more and more dangerous. I was drinking alone. I had totaled my car after already getting a DUI. I was risking losing custody of my daughter. I was risking my job. So the stakes were very, very high for me, and yet I still could not seem to put together I, I couldn't put together 30 days of sobriety, but I could barely put together 10 days of sobriety. I was, um, it gets caught in my throat right now just thinking about it because I was so, I was so scared, right, that I wouldn't be able to get this and that I would lose even more. Um, so the last, this is the Monday after what turned out to be the last time I drank. I did not know at the time that it would be the last time that I drank. I, um, I didn't know. So I had uh, driven myself to started to drive into work and I pulled off into the parking garage and I went upstairs to the top of the parking garage in Boston just because I needed to pause for a minute before I went to work. And I looked out um, across the city. I live in Boston and I decided to call my ex-husband, who is my ex-husband now. We were separated at the time because I just needed to hear a familiar voice. So this is where the, this, this passage picks up. As the phone rang, I thought about what I would say when Jake answered. I wasn't sure. I, was, I just desperately needed to hear a steady voice. By then, after almost two years separated, the rawness between us had been slightly eased by time. I couldn't tell him what, ha what happened on Friday. He didn't know I was still struggling like this, and it would rightfully worry him too much for our daughter's sake. I counted two rings, then three, then four, and then he answered. As soon as I heard his voice, the back of my eyelids burned with tears, big salty pools of them. I caught him up on the logistics of the weekend, little stories about Alma, our daughter, new things she had said or done, the stuff only he'd be interested in. He caught on that I was crying and asked if I was okay. I said I was, that I was just having a hard time and that it had been a long weekend. Despite all the mess between us back then, we were still each other's first call when something happened, even though we weren't sharing many of the details of our personal lives. He still knew me better than anyone else, and perhaps that was what I needed that morning, just to be known for what I was before and underneath all this shit. When we hung up, I sat there a bit longer, looking across the city. On the train, I held my backpack on my lap and closed my eyes. I was a little girl dressed up as a grown-up. More te tears rolled down my cheeks, and I didn't even bother to try to stop them. The woman next to me handed me a Kleenex from her purse. God bless the people who carry Kleenexes in their purse. As I sat there crying, I remembered something from years ago before Alma, before any of this. It was the end of a long day on my first yoga teacher training, and we were all gathered in a circle asking questions, discussing the day. One of the students raised his hand and said, matter of factly, I'm afraid I can't stop drinking. The room went silent. All eyes went to our teacher, David. Without missing a beat, he smiled, looked at him and said, of course you can. Are you drinking right now? No. And now? He smiled softly and said, no. And what about right now? We all smiled this time. No. This is how it is done, how anything is done. One moment, then the next, then the next. This is how this book is being written. I type this word, then this word, then this one. The, world's, the words build sentences. The sentences build a paragraph. A book is impossible, but a word and then another word is not. A lifetime of sobriety was impossible, 
but a moment of sobriety was not. I was doing it, and I was doing it, and I was doing it again. I love that. I, I, that's so perfect for right now, that we're all doing this with getting through what's happening to us right now. Just, I, I really, I mean, I haven't got through one day at a time for a long, 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 long time. I mean, I just haven't. But now right. I am. And I don't mean drinking. I don't, I don't want to drink. But in terms of just managing my mental health and emotions, it's like, I'm just going to get through today and this is how I'm doing it. And, and I love that. It just brings it right down to the real basic core of what it is to be sober yeah and what um and and this does apply to to anything that we're doing that is difficult because what what you know i go on to say in there that for me forever was impossible i just couldn't imagine it because i didn't know what life would look like sober i uh, and and what our mind does is when when we get anxious is try to control what's happening and try to especially control the future Right. And that's what causes so much anxiety because uh, it takes us out of our feelings. It's an attempt to suppress our feelings and to try to put some controls in. And I would just ask myself all the time, and I'm doing that right now. Okay. What is really going on right in this second? And right in this second, I am a girl sitting in my home talking to you. That's all that's happening. Right. So you can do that any time and, and you can get through anything that way. Yeah. So we have lots of great questions. Here. Oh, good. So, uh, I want to start with this one because I think it's a great question. Alison has asked, how emotional was it reading the audio book? How did you handle that process of going through the events again after writing the book? Oh, that's a great question. I did not expect the audiobook to be any big deal. I thought it would just be like working, you know, just reading something. It was extraordinarily difficult. I was so surprised. It took, wow. uh, we did two sessions and I did, my dear friend, I'm so lucky because my dear friend has a recording studio. It's what he does for work. So, and he's very familiar with my story and, um, and so I felt like I was sitting, you know, at least with a friend. And it took us two days, total of 13 hours to record that. And um, and it's hard because it was, it's arduous, right? You, you miss, it's very rare that you read. This is a 65,000 word book. It's very rare that you read something with 65,000 words out loud. So lots of missed words, but emotionally it was really heavy. I It was like reliving um, a lot of the chapters. And a after a couple of them, I had to go and, and uh, Jim would, you know, rub my shoulders and we'd do some shaking and, and breathing and um, work it out. So it was it was extraordinarily difficult. There were chapters that um, that were heavier than others, too. Wow. I never yeah. asked you about that before. Since I saw that question, so that's a really interesting question. Um, Melanie's asked, where did you get the courage to share your story? And and I kind of want to add a little bit to that because I think what I said right from the beginning when I read it was, this is amazing because you talk so much about being a drunk mom. And we've, we've, uh, we actually have a podcast episode coming out next week, you guys, Laura and I, where we go into more detail about that. And, and I do, it was incredibly courageous because it's not, that, that's not something you do hear much about. Yeah. Uh, I get asked this at every single book, you know, any time I get asked this, <clears throat> uh, it's probably the second most asked question. I don't know. I, I don't, I was just trying to save my life. That's all I've been doing this entire time. Um, was trying to save my own life. And for me, that meant creating one version of myself in the world, one version. And that required um, being very honest about everything. And it's not that you, um, what, I, what, I, what I've been saying, and, and when I really look inside, um, this is the answer. When, by the end of my drinking, all my worst nightmares had already happened, all of them. I was a liar a cheater, a stealer. I was someone who put my daughter in extraordinary danger. I chose 
all kinds of things over her and all kinds of things over people that I, that I supposedly loved. All my worst nightmares had already happened. So when you're at that point, it's like, there's not much to lose, you know? And I knew no matter what people were going to think of me, what they think of me. So why it was almost like, why, why don't I just write my own story? Why don't I just own it all? Right. Own it all. Um, uh, because people are going to talk anyway, no matter what forever, they're always going to talk. And I, I was someone who deeply, deeply, deeply cared what people thought of me for all of my life. I would do anything to make sure that I was okay with you. Right. But it's futile. We all know that. And, um, <coughs> Yeah, so it's, it's something in there about, like, all my worst nightmares had already happened. And I knew very, very um, specifically that writing was saving my life. So I didn't want to, I also think, you know, I, I did reach a moment once where I was like, I don't want to get to the end and have it be like, gosh, I, I really cared. I did a great job caring what people think of me. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, that's what I want yeah. on my my tombstone yeah, yeah, and in my eulogy yeah. is she did such a great job caring what people thought. Yeah. So Susie from accounts really likes Laura. So yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> that's yeah. really all that mattered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so Melanie's asked a question, how has publishing this book affected you since it's been out there? Hmm. Ah, uh, there hasn't, it's not that different, you know, I, um, I mean, sure, there are some things that are different, like I'm getting these new experiences of being, you know, uh, interviewed for things, and there's a little bit more like buzz or something, but my day-to-day -day life has changed zero. Um, it feels, I'm very proud that I was able to complete something that I, had been such a dream of mine, so that feels really wonderful. I'm not someone who has ever completed projects. That was like, um, I couldn't complete anything when I was drinking. I, 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 you know, so, so, and this was like my dream, my biggest dream. So it's a little surreal, I will say that, but it hasn't changed much of anything. Um, I'm mostly excited to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're excited to read it again. Um, lots of time to write right now, so. Mm-hmm. Um, so Tracy's asking, how do you deal with uncomfortable situations with family? Your story about your mum's dinner party really resonated with me. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I don't, so I don't, just to put some peace in your heart, I don't have uncomfortable situations around drinking anymore. I don't because I'm 100% comfortable with me and I love being a sober person. So, but in early sobriety, it was it was difficult, and that scene with my mom was extraordinarily difficult. Um, it's a process. It doesn't. It's something that evolves, interaction by interaction, conversation by conversation. Um, one thing that the the thing that helps the most is to you, Veronica often says, we live in the outside world and in the inside world, right? And what family, what people are saying, what people are doing, what people think of us exists in the outside world. And we tend to focus, most people tend to focus a lot on the outside world. And sobriety required me to go inside to be okay. And so what I did to be okay in those outside moments was go continue to do the work inside. Right. And, and primarily that meant um, clearing up the shame that I had about being a person who had this problem. Once I was free of that, no interaction was painful about when it came to sobriety anymore. I mean, there are lots of interactions that are painful with family, but um, I don't have the shame anymore. And so most of the time <clears throat> our shame uh, what we perceive as other people's judgment is our own judgment of ourselves. It's our own shame. And we think it's about them, but it's not. Uh, so it's the answer is always to do the inner work on yourself. And then the outside world feels very different. 
doing the work, most important thing. Uh, Kristen's asked, as a mom who has also put her kids in danger, how do you forgive yourself? Same answer. <laughs> Same answer. Um, I understand, first of all, I had to listen to and share, listen to other stories of women and mothers uh, because I thought I was the worst, right? We all think we're the absolute worst. So I had to listen to stories of other mothers who had done the same things I had. And in hearing their stories, I knew that this wasn't a situation where Laura was just a giant piece of shit, right? It was like, oh no, I had an addiction. I had a significant problem and there are reasons for that, right? Um, and I had to share my story. You can't just read books and listen to podcasts. You have to actually speak the words, write the words, whatever it is. And there's this alchemical process that happens when we do that. That's why therapy works, right? Um, we get our story straight when we continue to tell it over and over and over and over again. And that story is not a story that you are a degraded person who um, was so weak and didn't love her kids enough. It's that you are a human being who got addicted to alcohol because it's an extraordinarily addictive substance and you have underlying issues that led to that and that you um, were a person who became very sick and you were in a lot of pain. That's the story. So you have to do, again, this is the inner, this is the inner work that we all have to do to get free of that. I have said that, that and Veronica too, that the um, there is a special kind of shame for mothers who drink. I think it is the most painful shame that there is. And that's why I, why I talk about it a lot. That's why I include it in my story. That's why I will always, I, I say at my, my uh, events, because a mother always, you were there, Veronica, New York. Someone always, some mother always stands up with tears in her eyes and asked me that very question. And I say, I wrote this book for anybody who needs to hear it, but I especially wrote it for you, right? I especially wrote it for you, so. Yeah, I, that, I, as soon as I read it, I was like, this is the, this is the message. This is the most powerful uh, part of the whole book. Uh, and your whole message. I, I just think it's amazing. I, I've worked, I mean, before I became a mother, I worked uh, with many women with alcohol problems who were mothers. And, and I just wanna say, now I am a mother, they did not love their children any less than I do. They, yeah. Their fierce mama bear love for their children was equal to mine. They just had a disease, condition, illness, whatever you wanna describe it, that isn't anything to do about willpower or morals. It, it's an illness that needs you, you have to work on and you need support with to transform it. And it's an it's an inside job. It's not just changing your outsides. Yeah. Um, OK, so uh, Joe is asking, when did you start to feel secure in your sobriety? You had a history of slipping like me. So when did you realize that was behind you? Mm. Honestly, I would say it, year two, I felt like I really just the obsession had lifted and I wasn't in danger of drinking anymore. But it took that it took that much time and, and that much just diligence and this the um, what led me, I, I think there were many things that allowed me to get to the point of getting there. But but a big one is what I read about in the beginning. And you hear it all the time, but it, it's a cliche for a reason. I really kept it in the day. And I just did everything I possibly could to stay sober in that day. And I even told myself, like, look, you can drink tomorrow if you want to drink tomorrow or just not drinking today, Right. And that felt doable. And then I'd get to the next day and I'd say the same thing. But it took me two years. Oh, good answer. Yeah, it, it does. I, I, the first year to two, it has to be the main thing. Like it's the, it's not like a side thing you think of every so often because alcohol wasn't. If you think how much time and effort and brain space alcohol took up, it needs to be the same, same for sobriety. But I also want to say you get to a point where 
just being sober is normal and easy. And as long as you continue to do the work on yourself, it just maintains itself. Right. Yeah. This is a great question from Annie. Uh, was it a struggle to write about those close to you, like your ex-husband and mom? Did it change any of your relationships? Mm. It was the hardest part about writing the book um, was how to write about other people how to include them in my story and how to make sure I was telling my story and not theirs. And also to give my permission to include them in my story um, because I'm sharing information about them, right? And not always pleasant information. My mom, um, my mom had a very, very, very hard time reading my book. Uh, even though I told her everything that was in it about her before she read it, I prepared her. She still had a really hard time reading it. Uh, and our relationship continues to change a lot because of the book and not, I, I would say it's on the path to better, but that path has been some big ups and downs. Um, she was, because we all internalize things, uh, we all think things are about us, right? And so as a mom, she felt very, um, it, her generation, people didn't talk about things. So it's like, oh my God, this is, be what is happening? You're just saying all these things and it includes me and it puts me in a bad light. And um, and over time she's she has, and of course she felt, she felt, um, so responsible and she felt so guilty that she didn't know how much pain I was in. She really didn't know. Nobody knew. So yeah, I was, I was very, I, it really stopped me from writing the book for a long time because I realized, Oh, this, I have to write about my ex-husband, my parents, my brother, whoever else. And, um, and I couldn't get myself to do it. And I took the advice of other authors who said, just write as if no one is ever going to see this so that you just get the book down. And then, you know, through the editing process, you have about 50,000 chances to revise and make sure and make sure and make sure that this is what you want to say. And, um, so I think if you're thinking about writing about people, which a lot of people ask is, is they're writing a book, um, do that, right? As if no one's going to ever see it. And, um, and then you have chances to, to edit going forward, but it's changed. It hasn't changed any other relationships. I would say my parents, primarily my brother and I are close. We've always been close, but I would say we're even closer now. Um, and my ex-husband, you know, I, I gave him, uh, I asked him long ago if he was okay with, me writing about him and he, and then I had to get permission from him too. And he said, yes, but he's, you know, never read it, read it and won't read it. And so different for everybody. Uh, Kim's asking, uh, Laura, how do we deal with those family members who do not respect our sober boundaries and continue drinking alcoholically in front of us? We can't control their actions. How do we avoid putting ourselves in vulnerable situations with them? <clears throat> Sure, you have something to say about this. <laughs> um, you never have to put yourself in a situation where people are drinking alcoholically around you, ever, ever, period. Um, again, the answer is to do your internal work uh, and then how you which a, a big part of that internal work is learning healthy boundaries. And so you learn what what is tolerable for you, what is acceptable for you, what sort of the minimum that you are required uh, in order to be okay in a situation. And that's fluid and flexible over time, right? At the beginning, I really couldn't be around anything that was triggering like that. I couldn't be around big dreams situations of any kind and they're the hardest it's still the hardest so I just really avoided all that and a lot of people people think I can't cut off my family um, you can actually you can you can choose to not be around anything right mm -hmm. um, especially your family because you have to protect this thing right now um, their drinking is none of your business it's just not 
And um, that's another thing that you learn in developing healthy boundaries is you're responsible for you, you're not responsible for them. Um, and you learn, you know, uh, to, to look at a, to, before you go into a situation, um, thinking, like sort of playing it out, what's this gonna be like? What do I need? Am I willing to do this? And um, and so, and a lot of that is trial by error, right? You go to a holiday, four of your family members get blasted, and you go, okay. So we're gonna change the way we approach this next time. Another thing you can do is offer, say, I'm not available for that, but I'm available for this. You know, I do that with a lot of friends, like in the beginning. I. I want to see you, but I'm not, I, I'm not available and comfortable right now going out to dinner, but I would love to go to coffee with you. Or I would love to go to a yoga class with you, or I'd love to take a walk with you. Um, yeah. So it's, what would you say? Well, yeah, I, um, I, I would say the, the work there that you need to do, Kim, is around boundaries and, and it's not other people's job to respect our boundaries. Um, right. what, nearly whatever program I teach, Boundaries is always like usually one of the first parts of that because most people I know have bad boundaries and particularly people with an alcohol problem. So we teach other people how they can treat us. Mm -hmm. And that's something we have to begin to consciously undo in our sobriety is a lot of the time we have taught people that are, you know, we don't know how to say no, that we'll put up with this, that you know, when we say, oh, I don't want you to drink around me, we don't really mean it, you know. So we, we teach other people that they can violate our boundaries. So it's a process in sobriety, beginning to teach them different things. And the thing is with boundaries, people will also always push back. And, mm -hmm. and we have to expect that. So I, one of the key things about laying down a boundary is expect to repeat it over and over and over. It takes a while for people to kind of forget that things have changed now because they're so used to you being another way. So again, that's a massive part of the work we have to do. It, it's, it's, I, I'd say it's probably one of the foundation stones is boundaries. For, for, uh, Brené Brown says this, you, you can't be happy unless you have rock solid boundaries. So it's true mm. for everybody, but it's especially true for us. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so I've got a question here from Jill. Uh, I've read many quit lit books and I've never read a chapter like The Truth About Lying. What made you plan that subject as a standalone chapter? That chapter was a huge light bulb for me and pushed me back to sobriety. Yeah, that's the one I hear about the most um, because I think even if you're pretty far along in sobriety, you can be dishonest with yourself and others and we don't typically see people pleasing for example as a form of dishonesty I chose it as a standalone chapter for me because it was the the, the biggest turning point of my sobriety like by far um, and I had never thought of myself as a liar we know when we're outwardly lying and manipulating people, usually, right? But we don't think of um, people pleasing and keeping the peace as forms of dishonesty. And yet those behaviors, and this is all related to boundary stuff too, those behaviors are um, cause extraordinary discomfort and pain in our relationships. And that's how I reached, I got to year three and, um, my relationships, I had, I had certain relationships that were so difficult and my romantic relationships were really difficult and I couldn't really, I couldn't get out of it and I couldn't figure out what was going on. I just felt very out of control and I started to do work and, um, through internal work realized that the patterns showed up for me. Like, these are the relationships where you have difficulty. And it was always the same situation. It was like, I'm so nice and I'm being victimized by this bully type of person, right? And um, 
why are they so terrible and why why am I being taken advantage of, right? And it was like, no, you are misrepresenting who you are, what you want, what you need, what is what works for you from the very beginning. You are acting like you're okay with things that you're not okay with. You don't speak up for yourself when you feel violated. You don't, um, you overextend to people like you, you know? Just patterns that I developed in childhood to survive, really, and to, to navigate my environment, but as an adult, they're extremely maladaptive and dysfunctional. So it was pointed out to me that that is dishonesty. And it was like, oh, <laughs> well, that's a whole different thing than I thought it was. But the beautiful part of it is that it made me not the victim anymore. It was like, I have an active role in this dysfunction now, and I can see it, and I can do something about it. Um, so that's why I chose it. And I, I noticed that this is, um, this is, I think, where a lot of people stop. Like, they don't do that part of, of um, self-inquiry and analysis and um, evaluation of their own honesty in relationships. Intimacy, we all feel very lonely, um, or we can feel very lonely. And intimacy, my friend Meadow has this beautiful definition where she says, um, intimacy is sharing your truest thoughts and feelings with someone. Shared true thoughts and feelings. Having a kind, compassionate witness to your truest thoughts and feelings. Most of us um, don't do that. We're like, we share about 90% and we leave 10% off right and um it creates a lot of loneliness so it's it's hard to be really honest but that's why i included it is it's been the biggest change for me that i've had to make in in my recovery thank you that was a really good answer uh jillian's asked can you talk about triggers identifying them i know mine but others don't maybe maybe others don't and how do you deal with those yeah, uh, uh, this is a learning, you know, learning process for sure. I, I notice triggers by how my body feels. Um, I would typically use language like I feel anxious or I feel afraid. Uh, I feel unsteadied. Um, I, do, I don't have triggers that make me want to drink anymore but I have triggers that set me off emotionally, mental health wise, right? Um, how to identify them? I would say it's pretty easy. I think we all know when we're triggered, right? We usually, we start spinning off. We either start blaming people or we start um, feeling just off. You feel like you feel this desire to numb or to escape, right? So the more mindful we get, the more aware we can get of what is setting us off. A lot of times we think it's something and it's really something else. Like family for me is a huge trigger. It is. Um, not not um, taking care of my, what I call non-negotiables will cause me to be triggered. Non-negotiables are very simple. It's like sleep, exercise, water, and um, sweating. Those are my non-negotiables. If I get off of those, I'm going to be triggered by all kinds of things. The triggers will just start to find me, right? So I think you just, you know, you remain aware. Um, and the longer you go, the more you realize like, oh, that person or situations like that or um, being tired. I mean, HALT, hungry, angry, lonely, tired is a really good acronym. You know, being hungry, being angry, being lonely, being tired, huge triggers. So... Uh, one, one of my uh, triggers that it doesn't happen very often, but for me, it's um, it, being in England when the World Cup is on the soccer or the European Cup, because it's really like in Europe, like soccer is like it's the much, much more of a bigger deal. And uh, being in Cambridge where I live and the sun is shining and the pub by the river and everyone, everyone like the, literally the whole country is wearing their soccer shirts and getting ready to watch England play. I, this little fantasy goes through my brain where I go, oh, it'd be so nice to have like a 
dry white wine spritzer and the watch the and and what I do is I allow it to travel through and then I say to myself and you can do that if you're okay with the cost of that because then you'd have another and then you'd have another then you'd go out and try and find some cocaine and then da -da 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 -da, and then you'd wake up in the morning feeling suicidal are you good with that and I'm like whoa no <laughs> and it goes um Melanie's asking, I had a knot in my stomach reading a section about that wedding night. Then I felt relief when you wrote that you weren't giving any more detail about that in the book. Can you talk about that decision? Sounds like you may have wrestled with it. Oh, not writing about the scene in the book. Yeah, I wanted to be really... Um... Is it, that's the wedding, your brother's wedding? Is that that Yeah, one? it was when I left um, my daughter oh. in a hotel room. It's how the... the book opens up. We, we, I, I just want to say the podcast episode we did in December, is that right? I think it went in December. You talked about that in a lot more detail. So you might want to check that out uh, on the Sober Full podcast. Sorry. Yeah. Ahead. I don't know if that's she wants to hear more or doesn't want to hear more. It sounds like she's wondering why I didn't write about it. But I didn't want this book to be like trauma porn. <laughs> <laughs> out of addiction memoirs are a very... <sighs> long drawn out story of all the bad things that happened mm -hmm. and while that can be somewhat useful to a degree I didn't want it to be that I wanted to um, really use the best examples I could of a particular experience uh, and I didn't see the value in going into detail there um, the point was that it happened and that it changed everything so yeah, I didn't, I just, it didn't feel right to do that. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember when, uh, so Laura had sent me, um, I was reading it on my phone uh, before the book was published. And uh, I remember reading it and like, it's funny because I've only known you sober and it's like my husband has only known me sober. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading that and I'm just going, oh my God, Laura you have a real alcohol problem. Like I wanted to time travel and go back and go, Laura, you you've got a real alcohol problem <laughs> and yeah it's it's I mean it, it's it really is like we are I really believe that phrase we are restored to sanity because when we're in that fog like the the way we can rationalize and justify and minimize these things that happen because we all have our own personal version of that I think no matter what it is whether it was with your kids or not I know I have my own version of that when I was drinking we do this really complicated equation in our brain that ends up with well I can just have one or two after mm -hmm. and then when we've got like when we're at this point when we've got some sobriety and we know we don't want to drink again we can look back and just be like the only way to describe that is insanity yeah yeah yeah, I just didn't want, I didn't want that to be the focus. And um, I don't, there, you know, we've all read books like that. And I've read all of them, I'm sure. But I just, I, it just didn't feel right. It didn't feel right for my daughter either. Yeah. Um, Beryl is asking, can you speak to the inner work and what types have been most effective? Therapy, groups, AA? Question mark. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I have <laughs> I have thrown the book at all the work all the work possible. Um, therapy, absolutely. I'm in therapy now. I am such a strong believer in in therapy and and having a good therapist. I've had some not great therapists, and that isn't helpful. But but I have found one that is excellent. Um, she does. She's sober, so she understands specifics of addiction. She's a woman, so she understands the specifics of being a woman. Um, and I'm not saying that's what is required, but it was what it's what's helpful to me. Um, the 12 steps absolutely um, were game changing for me, and having a sponsor and being connected to other women in sobriety. Um, I have done, I am a yoga teacher, so yoga, I continue to do a lot of training in the yoga philosophy, yogic philosophy, which I find very helpful to me. Um, I find Buddhism to be very helpful. Um, I mean, I don't consider reading books and podcasts and all that work. It's like supplemental. It helps because you understand more and you, you, um, 
you have a broader knowledge base. And I mean, I think reading is hugely, hugely beneficial. Um, what other, what other um, specific forms of work I've done? I think those are the formal ones that I've done, you know, really therapy, yogic philosophy and, t and, and yogic studies and 12 steps have been my formal, formal forms of work and continue to be. I think what's important to mention here is that it's ongoing. It, it's oh, not, yeah. it's not, it's not that you go and do something for a few, it, it's not like having a broken leg where you go and it's a few weeks and, and then it's fixed and then you're all right and maybe you need some OT, but then you're okay. It's not like that. This is, I've always talked that it's, um, this, we do personal development. Every human being on the planet has to do personal development, but a lot of people don't know that. They, they mm -hmm. get lost in the external world and they don't know that they have to develop their internal world. Um, and actually, this comes to a question that uh, has come up. Uh, we are the luckiest that we get forced into doing it, and then we get these incredible rewards. How? Tell us about the title and and this catchphrase that that really is yours. Where did that come from? Yeah. So I, like most people, thought when I had to get sober that it was the worst thing that could ever happen to me, and that people who could drink normally were so lucky, and that's all that I wanted. I just wanted to go back in time if there was such a time to when things when I could drink normally and, um, and be able to do that, I didn't want to get sober. And I was laying there early in sobriety after that after I had about 30 days. So I had gone through that whole purgatory time and everything. And I was laying there with my daughter in bed, uh, one random night, and uh, she was asleep. And I was crying for some reason. I'm not sure why I was crying a lot then. And it had passed. Like whatever wave of sadness had passed. And I just had this like very quiet moment where I realized like I was safe. My daughter was safe. We had clean sheets. I was going to wake up in the morning with no hangover and no new destruction created. And that I had just survived feeling a feeling and that, that, that this is what I wanted. Like this is what I wanted, this direct experience of life. That's what I'd always wanted, right? Always. And God met me in that moment for sure. Um, as I, and that's my, been my experience all along is when I am most alone and when I am forced to go inside, I am met there. And that's that I, I had this thought like, no, I, I'm the lucky one. Like I'm lucky. I get to do this. I get to wake up to my life instead of continuing to, to half live it forever. And, uh, I posted something like that to Instagram and said, we are the luckiest. And it just became a thing, you know, it became a thing. And I truly believe that anybody who gets the call to wake up to their lives is so lucky so mm. lucky because i can look now and think i would i thought i was living and i wasn't i thought i understood life and i didn't i knew nothing <laughs> except for you know how to have the next good time so that's where it came from i i love that and i just want to headline that your al alcohol problem all it is everybody is a call to wake up to your life mm -hmm. that's all it is it's a call and it will keep calling you until you're ready. I love yeah. that. And yeah, it, it's just so deeply, deeply true. Uh, we've got time for a couple of quick questions. There's one here from Tracy. Uh, I'm finding my program easier the longer I'm sober. Do you ladies celebrate your sober anniversary count days, attend recovery meetings? I, I don't, I, I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of how many days sober I am now. I, de I definitely did in the first year, you know, I was celebrating every month. I got chips. I was attending meetings a lot and, um, I would certainly celebrate the year now, like when uh, next September, this September, when I turn six years sober, I will, I will celebrate that and commemorate it and, you know, um, feel great about that. Um, I do attend meetings, although not as often, although I am finding in my, in this time, 
when uh, things are more stressful, I am leaning back hard into the program that I found in AA. Uh, it just feels like such a bedrock to me. So um, that's why I decided to host these online sobriety meetings. I mean, I just, for me, it's like a return to center, you know, just the basics of service, community, or fellowship, whatever, and, and God. Um, yeah, so that's my that's my story. And so much of my work is in recovery, too. So I stay very connected to the recovery community, and uh, I still work with a sponsor. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm almost 20. I'll be 20 years sober on May 2nd, uh, and uh, I still do all those things. And, and the, the reason I have almost 20 years of sobriety is because I still do those things. It wasn't mm. a one-off. I, I, because we have to grow. We have to continue to grow. Uh, where, where I, I want to tell you where I was at 19 years sober was pretty awesome, but I couldn't mm. be there now. If I went back to how I was where, in my mindset and my emotional and spiritual development at 19 years sober, it would feel less than what I have now because it's const constantly growing and becoming. So um, lots of you have asked about the work and, and doing doing this inner work and all, all of that kind of stuff. And Laura and I... Uh, so Laura and I have a program that's launching today and it's called The Work. It's called The Work with uh, Laura McCowan and Veronica Valley. And we went back and forth uh, with this in the last couple of weeks, whether this was the time to launch a, a program, a paid program, uh, because obviously <laughs> we all know what's happening. Uh, lots of people have financial insecurity, all of that kind of stuff. And we, we spoke to our teams and uh, discussed it. And what we realized is that people don't need less support right now. They need more support. So that we were going to launch it and put it down into the world for the people that it's right for right now. Uh, it's something we've been thinking about and talking about for a long time and it's really beautiful that it's come together. And it's it was actually going to be a seven week program where we took you through the key fundamentals of the work, like the real kind of foundations of the work you need to do for long-term sobriety, but we wanted to offer a bonus week. So we just decided to start a week early. We're gonna start on April 1st with a bonus uh, week where we want to uh, do a whole kind of uh, session on grounding, on calming and processing feelings because uh, I, I, that's a big issue right now. People have a lot of very stressful, frightened, anxiety feelings, and we want to be able to help you minimize them, deal with them so that then you can be open to do the work because this is never going to go away and and it's certainly my belief that we are going to have uh when all this is settled a, a big mental health crisis i see mm -hmm. i do see a lot of people relapsing and i see a lot of people drinking excessively just to cope with what's going on so what yeah. we put in now will pay off months down the line when things get better and they will get better so laura do you want to tell them a little bit about the the components of the program sure yeah, so so again, we've been talking about working together for years at this point, but um, we so the the first week, as Veronica said, we're doing a, a bonus call where we're just doing a grounding. It'll be like a welcome call. You're going to offer um, some EFT, and I'm going to be offering meditation. And then we get into right away. We get into the uh, work of the truth, the truth of you, the truth of your story. So we start there, then we go to boundaries, as we talked about, learning about boundaries. Uh, then we are getting into the what I'm calling the anatomy of emotion. So I've done a lot of work and have a lot of background in um, studying how our emotions work and why we have them and what the purpose of them is we often feel like emotions are either good or bad and we do everything we can to not feel bad emotions. I mean, that's essentially why people drink is to not feel the bad emotions uh, or we're not capable of feeling them. We fear them. So I'm going to go through the five core, five of the core basic emotions that haunt us, fear, uh, shame, anger, and grief and I'm gonna break those down for you and tell you in an almost technical way the purpose that they serve and um, how you can feel them. And when you know, for me now, I am a terrible crier, for example. I, I really block sadness away 
And um, it's it's unconscious. Like I don't try to, but then I get really jammed up. And when I cry, I'm so relieved now because I know the purpose of sadness. I know the spiritual purpose of sadness. And it's like, thank God, right? So when we we feel like we can handle emotions, we can almost handle anything, right? Because uh, we can allow them, we can see them as energetics that just need to move through us and that they serve a purpose. Per- emotions, every emotion is asking us to do something. So when we're armed with that, uh, we are so much better equipped to be resilient in the world. So I'm going through that. That'll be two weeks. And then um, i got to look at the last two weeks. Oh, we're talking about... Um, this a spiritual pa- practice, developing a spiritual practice and what that actually means and that it's actually a very practical thing. And then you're do you're going to be offering um so I don't have it right in front of me, which is silly. Uh the the last week is the uh is the next steps is about building your own uh roadmap with all of the stuff that you've learned over the, the seven or eight weeks with us. So the last week is doing that. Um, a couple of people ask questions and I just want to say that the, the pro- this program is for anybody at any, it's for women at any stage of their sober journey who feel like they haven't done the work, have no clue what the work is, want to do the deeper work. So wherever you are on your sober journey, um, and you, you just don't, you feel like you're struggling, you just don't know or haven't seen what the sober work is uh then this is the program for you um mm-hmm. it we are enrolling now there you can go to uh lauramcowan.com it'll be up in this facebook group uh it will be on my uh hopefully on my website soon it will be on our instagram accounts my instagram is at love soberful laura's is laura underscore mccowan um so there's lots of links everywhere if you have questions we're very open to it um, we, we believe this will be tremendous value to people. And we believe that, that right now having this real structured support, uh, there is also payment plans, so you can break up the payments. Um, this really structured support would be really helpful, uh, to people as we go through the next few weeks. We obviously all have our, we have our free offerings too, by all means, if this isn't the program for you right now, uh, go and check those out too. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, this is the last one. I I don't want to forget this. You have there is a week on overcoming limiting beliefs. Oh, God, yes. (laughs) I didn't believe that. Yeah, Yeah. we're going to do. Yeah, that's and again, that's a core part of uh, for me, boundaries, overcoming limited beliefs, the beliefs, all of this stuff is like this is the core stuff that we have done to get where Mm -hmm. we are. So that's what we're teaching. So I want to wrap this up. Lots of people said they're in. Uh, Yeah, wonderful. Lots of people saying they're joining. That's so great. Um, I want to thank Laura so much for spending this time with us. So many people watched this. It really was uh, wonderful. Um, I think we have one more uh, question tomorrow from the book. So check out the prompt that will pop up in Facebook. um, And and you can follow Laura in all kinds of places, but mostly on Instagram. Uh, Mm -hmm. Any questions about the program, just let us know. And uh, thank you so much for being part of our wonderful community. This just, we get so much out of this uh, and being with you. Um, So it's really, um, uh, yeah, it's really extraordinary. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Laura. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye.